uh, next up is uh, Dr. Michael Cole. Dr. Cole is Assistant Professor of Wildlife Management and Wildlife Special Extension Specialist in the Warren L School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Georgia. He specializes in addressing applied research questions related to wildlife, spatial distributions, and habitat use. We're on, Dr. Cole. All right, uh, let's see here. Um, can you see that, Frank? Oh, yeah. Need you to hit share button for us, Mike. Yeah. Oh, I got to share. Yeah, man. That's, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, share screen. Here we go. Let's see. All right. Now. Oops. All right. How's that? Cooking with grease now. Are you sharing the right screen? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Um, so. Today I'm going to touch on, uh, particularly I'm going to focus on two different um, ongoing research projects, one in central Georgia, one in north Georgia, um, on deer populations and looking at habitat management and questions like that. Um, with, within the context of prescribed fire and, and its benefits um, for deer populations, and then talk a little bit about recommendations going um, based on some of those studies. So uh, here's a really nice quote by Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife conservation, if you will. Um, the central thesis of game management is this, game can be restored by the creative use of the same tools which have heretofore destroyed it. The ax, the plow, cow, fire, and gun. Management is their purposeful and continuing alignment. So there's a lot of ways we can manage wildlife habitat. Here in the Southeast, um, kind of the ones we, we commonly employ and think about, um, thinning, prescribed fire, disking, herbicide, and grazing. Um, so, of course, today, um, because of the topics, we're going to focus on prescribed fire. Um, but in doing that, I want to step back a little bit um, and think about the historical context of the ecosystems of the southeast and how wildlife species evolved with fire on the landscape, in, in this case, deer, but all species. So here's a, a just a map here of the different fire regimes um, from a USDA um, Forest Service report. Um, you can see here the highest frequency of fire intervals, one to three years, was the coastal plain regions. Um, and the lowest frequency was moving up into the uh, interior Appalachians, uh, where you might be seven to 10, 20 years. Um, there, is, there is some um, uh, variation in those frequencies within the Appalachians uh, with, the, with higher frequency on those eastern and western edges. Um, so in this country. And then just to give you a sense, and we, we've kind of seen this in a number of different presentations talking about these fire intervals, um, but in these mixed pine oak forests, an average fire interval, 11, 11 and a half years, um, you can see um, it, it varies across different study areas. This is a paper um, for 2013 um, with a range of these historic fire intervals from 1 to 20, 25 years. Um, what's important to think about this from wildlife context, though, is that when these fires historically occurred. So about 75% of the fires that, that this group could classify in these three different study areas for these um, oak pine forests were in the dormant season. There was a little, uh, another quarter of that was in that early growing season and very little of it was in the late growing season. Um, in more of the Piedmont region um, is where we'll talk a little bit about one, another one of these um, sites that's going, uh, that's, that's looking at these kind of questions. Um, fire was a little bit different, uh, low elevation sites, the range might be two to six years historically. Um, and that fire interval was a little bit longer in more dry and poor sites, uh, just because it takes that much longer to accumulate biomass that can carry a fire. So starting, say, early 1900s, we, we start to see a large um, scale shift in fire regimes with large scale fire suppression. This is important uh, for wildlife uh, productivity in particular. So in these oak dominated forests, um, this means we're these forests that have lack fire prescribed or other um, we see a transition to these shade tolerant and fire intolerant species, uh, such as ma red maple and others. 
Um, in more of your traditional uh, pine forest, you're talking about competition with hardwoods as they uh, encroach and, um, and fill up that mid-story in particular. <clears throat> so, so what does this all mean in terms of wildlife habitat? Well, without fire on the landscape, you're talking about this development of that dense hardwood mid-story. Um, this is blocking a lot of sunlight from the ground and that's inhibiting the development of that herbaceous ground cover, that food that deer really need. Um, as, a, as a result, we're really talking about a significant decrease in habitat quality overall. Um, the other consideration that's important that to, to, to recognize is that if fire is absent from the system for a long enough period, the system really moves beyond a point where fire can be used to restore it. You're talking about either mechanical methods or herbicide combined with fire to, to restore that system. Um, like most species in the southeast, um, but deer in particular, um, all of these issues about uh, maintaining that, that disturbance regime comes back to the fact that deer response, deer abundance, productivity, however you want to describe it, is directly related to the amount of canopy cover on the ground. So this is, uh, you know, a, a simple cartoon of what we'd expect to see. Um, with in the southeast with uh, disturbance regimes. So we might have a clear cut, we might have a, a fire. We set the system back to zero and we see this progression moving to grassland, shrubs, pine forest, and, and so on. Um, historically, we know that deer really, really like um, this kind of this three to eight year old window, um, but they require different components of this entire uh, succession matrix across the landscape to fulfill all of their um, uh, life cycle uh, needs. So in the southeast then, you know, as I already kind of mentioned, we're talking about fires being this integral part of the system. This, the species, the wildlife species deer included, they evolved within the system. So how do we use prescribed fire to mimic that historical process? Um, well, because of its importance, that really does mean it's one of our most important tools in this system because of its ability to reset the succession and control these hardwoods. More importantly, not only does that, but it actually shapes the structure and the composition of the plant species. And so we'll, this first study I'll walk you through from Central Georgia, we'll talk about some of those um, impacts that the prescribed fire regime can have on the ground, which then respond, are responded to by the deer. Um, I also want to highlight, though, that there's, fire can be combined with another, a number of different tools, um, herbicide, thinning, whatever it is. In particular, fire without thinning, you, if you use prescribed fire without thinning in these pine forests, you may not get the desired results you're looking for. Um, so talking about fire in pine systems, um, one of the things I want to highlight is that that for, for these, for most species, the pines really are not the habitat that we're talking about. We're really talking about managing the pine systems to manage the habitat to improve uh, the system for, for deer management. And this is really done because, uh, through the amount of forage production that we can create on the ground. So this is where I said that really we're talking about a, a deer really love that three to six, seven year old, seven year old stand window. Um, so this is the amount of forage on the ground um, by year since a clear cut. Um, that relationship you can see doesn't change much after that canopy closes up, but you do see benefits of, of every three to five year prescribed fire in its ability to generate additional forage on the ground. Now we can contrast that to something like thinning where we're actually opening up the the upper canopy and allowing sunlight down on the ground, that's going to produce a, a, a massive amount of forage on the ground because there is that new sunlight. But what's really cool when we think about this is by combining fire and thinning, we actually can multiply that effect and we can produce more, more forage on the ground when we utilize multiple tools in concert to achieve our objectives. <clears throat> so Thinking about these loblolly pine stands, then, and I want to highlight um, this is research that's in partnership um, with faculty uh, in Warnell at the University of Georgia, but it's um, being uh, run um, out of the Auburn Deer Lab. Um, and so 
This is a Loblolly pine stand type study. Uh, this is important because we think about the southeast, we're talking about 10% of these forested lands being occupied by these Loblolly pines. Um, in this study system, uh, we have, there's five sites that they're, they're working across, um, both on Forest Service, I think two of them are on Forest Service and three of them are on WMAs. Um, these are 15 to 20 year old pine stands. And when they went, they went in here to these pine stands and they randomly selected the stands um, and implemented a three different levels of thinning on the landscape. So you had thinning down to 40, 60, or 80 basal feet per, uh, per acre. And you can see kind of the difference of what that looks like on the, um, from these camera photos. Now what's, what's really interesting about this study is they did two parts. They measured uh, the plant response, uh, but they also measured the actual deer response as well. So first we'll talk about the plant response. So this is percent coverage of, of forbs. So this is, this is green groceries on the ground that deer are looking for. And the first thing to note is that as uh, with this 80 uh, basal, uh, 80 feet per acre of basal area, um, we have the lowest percent cover. It makes sense. It has a lot of uh, above ground canopy cover, not as much sunlight. Um, both at the 40 and the 60 level, we see that it's increased forage. Surprisingly, the 60 appears to provide the most percent coverage over the 40. Um, and then they implemented fire on top of this landscape. Now, what's, what's interesting about this initial result is that fire didn't seem to make much difference. Um, you don't see a, a large difference in the amount of green groceries, the amount of food on the ground. But despite there being the same amount of, of, of forage on the ground, what made up that forage was drastically different. And so in particular, they saw 11 times more ragweed in these burn plots and 18 times more pokeweed in these burn plots. These are two species of plants that deer really, really uh, prefer on the landscape. So what does that mean um, if, if we're not creating perhaps more, more actual food on the ground, do we still get more deer because there's different types of the food? And, and the, the, the short answer is yes. So right here we have images per camera trap. So this is just the count, the number of uh, deer that they see in those plots um, by the different thinning levels. And so this is the case with no fire. So we see that there's more deer in the more open, um, uh, the more open canopy, but that changes very drastically when we think about the actual number of deer in the thinned and burned areas. And so you can see we actually nearly triple um, the number of deer that we see on camera um, in these very open areas that have been also burned, which means they have different plants on the ground that, so we have the ability to grow more plants and we have a preferred food source that the deer are attracted to. And so by combining these two, we see a large increase in our production for deer populations. Um, so what, what does that really mean? So in these uh, pine systems, I would say the, the general recommendation comes around to, you should be thinking about burning these systems every three to five years. Um, the nice thing about that burning regime is that is the same recommendation we'd probably provide for turkey and for rabbits. So you're getting multiple benefits for, um, for different species on the landscape. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a, a pine stand example. The other one I want to talk about is that Southern Appalachians um, uh, system, a little bit more of a, an oak pine uh, mixed forest. Um, this is quite a bit different because in this case, the trees in a lot of ways are a vital component of the habitat. Uh, because of mass producing species, they actually represent a forage resource themselves. Um, so you've got both your soft mass and your hard mass species that are important at different parts of the year. Um, but these systems are susceptible to the same issues of, of overgrown canopies, not enough light reaching the ground, and so you don't have the forage resource on the ground to produce some of those, particularly those soft mass species. Um, so we see the same questions. Uh, so we see in this case a high, high density or high amount of canopy cover means we have low forage on the ground. That means more predation. There, there's less hiding cover, particularly for fawns. We'll talk about that in a second. And this all translates to just less deer. 
there's less food and the deer that are there are gonna have a less, uh, a harder time surviving and reproducing. Um, so what this, what this lends itself to is, even though this is important habitat, this is producing food, we do need to be prepared to still manage the system to increase the overall health of the system and, and the uh, fauna that rely on it. So North Georgia study is an interesting um, focal area for, this, for these questions because uh, there's a large ongoing project there right now through the University of Georgia at Warnell. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's actually some really nice background information that has been put together by Andy Little and others um, prior to the initiation of the study that kind of looked across or made inferences based on these eight different uh, wildlife management areas in very North Georgia. Um, and I would argue probably that most of these results apply throughout a large chunk of the entire Southern Appalachians. So in, in this kind of summary review, literature review of a lot of different factors, what they did is they went through and they looked first at harvest data uh, of deer for the last 40 years. Um, they also were able to uh, accumulate information on the amount of oak uh, volume on the grounds and look at the age classes of those uh, of the species. And then lastly, um, assemble information on the amount of prescribed fire that's going on on these WMAs. We don't really have information um, in this case for off WMA areas, but at least it gives us a, a relative measure of, of the type, the level of management that's happening. All right, so the first thing that we can look at is what has happened to deer population. And this is not unique to North Georgia. This is the Southern Appalachians as a whole. Um, we have seen deer harvests really tank, in this case, over the last 40 years. So um, it's been cut by approximately 50%. Um, when we go from, uh, uh, you know, this level here of this is the number of, uh, our, the number of hunters that were successful per day. So killing one deer per day, you were a field, um, to now killing um, one deer every two days, you're out in the field. Um, so what, what's driving that? Um, there's a lot of things that are contributing to this, um, but some of the current work that, there, that um, Dr. Gino Giangelo and a, a number of his students are working on in North Georgia um, has, has really started to identify potentially fawn survival as an issue. And this is, becomes important when we talk about prescribed fire, and as I'll, I'll touch on in a second. So if you're not used to looking at survival curves, all you need to know is here is is one would mean you, know, you are guaranteed survival for that day, um, and zero means you will. There's no chance you'll ever live past that day. Uh, so in this case, we know from whitetail fawn survival studies across the country that first seven days is really bad for a whitetail deer fawn, and we see that very quickly. Um, you, you you're born and you have probably a fifty to uh, forty to fifty percent chance you're going to die in that first week. It can, it, it, that, that um, likelihood of you dying um, slows um, over time. And then once you make it out to about uh, a month, um, uh, four to five weeks out old, you're, you're pretty safe. You, there's a good chance you're gonna make it the whole, the whole uh, length of your childhood, if you will, um, up to you know, three to four months old. So we can see though that there's a, 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 a massive drop and this number is actually lower than what we would see in other populations. But, but it's not, I would argue, probably not drastically lower, but it is lower. So, but what is causing um, low fawn survival in the system? So the number one cause of fawn mortality in the system is, has been predation. Um, so to monitor this, what this amounts to is you capture a doe um, in winter, you implant what we call a vaginal implant transmitter, and that allows you, when she gives birth, um, that transmitter is, uh, is expelled, it sends out a signal, you can find that fawn, you can mark it at one day old, two days old, and you know exactly how old it was, and you can follow that through time. Well, they've been able to do this at this point over the first two years for 28 fawns um, um, that they have known causes of, of the, they either survived or died. Um, 24 of those 28 known uh, results uh, were mortalities, and 18 of those were predator caused. Um, and so you can see you know, this is 75% of your mortalities is being driven by predators in this system. Um, now, the other concern we have when we talk about deer management um, in, in a system like this is, well, um, the deer hunters themselves care. 
how, and, and, and you can see very quickly that as those deer numbers have declined, as fawn survival has declined, deer hunters have actually declined. And this, there's been 80, 81% decline over the last 40 years in the number of hunters um, in these North Georgia WMAs. Um, so the, the, naturally, the first thing we need to think about is how do we improve the habitat, thus to increase the number of deer so we can increase the number of hunters, make this a, a, a better experience for our hunters. Um, and that comes back to habitat then. So this is that um, graph I kind of mentioned. So here's the percent of these WMAs. Um, and uh, in 1979 is the black box. And in gray is, the, uh, is 2015. And you can see what's happened over time as we've transitioned from um, a, a small percentage, but a, a, but a measurable percentage of the landscape that was young, um, 0 to 10, 0 to 20 year old age classes. So um, younger um, oak and pine stands, mixed pine forests that basically had open canopy that allowed sunlight to get there to create food, to create fawning cover. Today, we have none of that left. Um, uh, all of these age stands are um, at a measurable level are above 20 years old and, and many of them are over 60 years old, um, which means this heavy ca closed canopy, which leads to reduced habitat quality. Um, and this is all really despite um, some very good active management. This is the number of acres burned on the Chattahoochee and Oconee National Forest with prescribed fire over the last almost 20 years. Um, and so there is active management going on. Um, but whether or not it's enough to compensate for long-term habitat changes, um, that's, that's the current question that they're trying to answer in North Georgia. Um, all right, so as a whole here, um, talking about prescribed fire in deer, um, really what it comes down to is if you can have fire, but if you still have a closed canopy, you're really not gonna see the response that you need. When you combine that fire with thinning activities, um, that's when you can actually see a large change in, in what your habitat quality looks like. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. One, it, it just, it's going to allow, um, it's gonna build up that forage availability within reach of the deer. It's gonna stimulate seed, um, seed bank germination for these uh, uh, forbs and grasses. And it's going to provide fawning cover, which is um, critical for that first week to two weeks of survival for deer. Um, to do this in the oak pine systems, we're really talking about if you if you already have an uh, open um, an open plot with no canopy cover, you know, to to minimize the chance of that invasion that those those oaks filling in that those openings, um, you're really thinking about burning every one to three years to maintain that opening. Within the actual forest, if you've got some broken canopy, you can be talking about burning every three to five years just to stimulate that forage, maintain the system without allowing that mid-story um, development. You'd also want to think about burning outside the fawning season, so May to July. Um, and this gets back to, uh, historically, this system never burned really in um, that growing season, so just be aware of that. Um, and rather burn late in the growing season um, and in that dormant season. Uh, burn, those late season burns and these dormant season burns, um, they're, they're, they're really important for creating greater diversity of cover and expanding the periods of high quality forage. Um, so, you know, that comes back to one to three to three to five years, doing that um, late season, dormant season, that would be ideal for deer uh, habitat improvements. So with that, I think we've got some time for questions. Um, if you have, if I don't get to your questions, all my information is right there. Uh, my email, uh, my office phone, which of course I'm not answering right now because we're all working from home. Um, so my email will be the best way to reach me. And then, if, um, and if you want, if you have Twitter, um, you can follow um, uh, a lot of the stuff we do with Warnell Outreach from there. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions if we have time. Thanks, Michael. We sure appreciate it. Everybody loves deer. Um, we did have a question in the middle of your talk, but I'm pretty sure you addressed it. Um, but we do have another one about deer harvest data. Uh, I'll post that for you. Can you discuss the idea that one factor in reduced deer harvest may be that hunters are being more discriminant in their harvest, as in quality deer management? Um, is this, I'm gonna, it was a long run, I'm gonna read it and make sure I, is it in the, 
Is in the QA or the chat? It's in the open uh, QA. Open QA. Um, yeah. Deer oh, okay, harvest I see, I see, data. Yeah. yeah. On deer harvest data, can you discuss the idea that one factor can reduce the harvest being comes with being more discriminant in the harvest? Um, so in this case, that those data are coming from the WMAs, um, which are not in QDMA <coughs> management. Um, so I don't expect that to be a large driver um, okay. in those uh, in that harvest statistics. Um, yeah, uh, I believe um, I believe that um, Gino is on here as well, and he might want to fill. He might want to address that as well, since he's much more familiar with that study than I am, since it's his since it's his study. But um, I, I would say that it's it's not a factor in that case. Okay, cool. And uh, the other question was about uh, short-term return interval prescribed burning in the mountains, but I think you, you addressed that in later. Okay. So I think we're good. All right, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, you notice on your agenda that uh, Hagen was supposed to be up, but I've said a couple of times he's not here. So this will be the end. I'll have a few remarks here, and then the meeting will be adjourned till next year. Uh, the North Georgia Prescribed Fire Council and Steering Committee would like to thank you for your support and your input to make the second annual North Georgia Prescribed Fire Council meeting a success. And if, without your support, uh, it wouldn't be successful. Uh, we had 409 people, the last count I heard, register, which I'd say makes the meeting successful. We represented 28 states, uh, so we're getting we're reaching out. We welcome your input and suggestions to make prescribed fire in North Georgia and all of the country and accept the practice. That's going to be a hard push in places like where we live in North Georgia. We'll take all our efforts to promote prescribed fire here or, or where you live, uh, where prescribed fire is not traditionally a practice like it is in South Georgia. Down there is a way of life and has been for hundreds of years. Up here, people see smoke and they call 911. Uh, no matter what it is, but we need to work on uh, community involvement, community education like we do up here. It'll take a lot of work of all of us to overcome the stigma that um, all smoke is bad, all fire is bad. Uh, but once you explain to these people, they live in a tinderbox around these homes in the side of these hills, that reducing the fuel helps them and helps the community. Sometimes they believe it, but it takes a lot of work on our part to get it across. Take what you learned today and put it to good use in your community and let the uninformed know that why we do it, what the purpose is, and that the smoke is temporary, uh, wildfire won't be. Um, a lot of people helped make this meeting a success on the steering committee. If I tried to name them all, I'd surely leave out somebody, but uh, there's one person I do want to spotlight who we haven't mentioned today, and uh, it's Mark Melvin. Mark is the uh, works at the Joseph W. Jones Ecological Research Center, Ditchaway, which is a whole different world down there. And Mark is the driving force behind what we do here. He's chair of the Coalition of uh, Prescribed Fire Councils across the country and has a lot of influence and a lot of knowledge about prescribed fire. And so we do whatever Mark tells us to do. When I asked Mike Worley when I first became chair what to do, he says the easiest job you ever had is to do what Mark says. So, so far it's worked out good. Thank you, Mark, for all you've done to support us. And uh, please mark your calendars for the Georgia Prescribed Fire Council meeting in Tifton on September the 30th. We hope we can have it in person, but if not, we'll have another virtual meeting just like today. It'll be packed with good speakers. We won't be able to have the food like we don't have today, we had last year, but we'll have a meeting anyway. And next year, the same time, we will surely have the third annual North Georgia Prescribed for our council meeting, same time, same place. Hopefully, me and Jasper are in person. Uh, by that time, we should be. Stay safe and keep the fire burning. And thank you for your attendance today. Mm -hmm.